you know, silver crushes inflation. In the 1970s, silver was up uh, 3,700%, easily doubling gold's return of about 1,400%, which is nothing to discount, that's for sure. But, you know, being the trade of the decade, I certainly believe that because I also feel that, and this certainly goes hand in hand, that inflation is is going to be the defining feature of this decade. Very much like the 70s, if you look at what took place in the 70s, the inflation was not rising up to a sort of a sustained high level. What happened was it would rise, fall somewhat, not to the previous low, then rise again, fall again, not again to the previous low. So we had three large inflationary waves in the 1970s. And these were in large part caused by central banks that would react to the inflation. They saw inflation, would raise rates, they would back off uh, as they saw the economy sort of start to struggle again. And that would allow the economy to rise again. The inflation would kick back in. They'd raise rates again. That would slow things down again. But each time the wave was a higher wave, you know, if we, if we talk a little bit about the economics of the 1970s, there's something very important to point out how in the 1970s, a really interesting comparison is that back then, the debt to GDP in the U.S. was 35%. So that meant, you know, much, much more manageable, much lower debt levels allowed the central bank to raise rates because the debt was manageable even at higher rates. Today, debt to GDP is 130%, almost four times what it was in the 1970s. This is what I call the Fed's dilemma. It knows the government's own debt is, is huge at about $30 trillion. Having to pay interest on that kind of debt at higher interest rates becomes unmanageable very quickly. And it also crushes many sectors, things like housing, which is very important, and all the you know periphery and, and related jobs. In that sense, I'm less worried because I feel that the Fed has and, and other central banks have much less wiggle room in terms of raising rates. And to me, that means that inflation is that much more likely to get out of hand. And that's why, you know, I saw it as a defining feature of this decade. At the margin, it's the investment demand for silver that's going to make the big difference and really push silver prices dramatically higher. In 2020, there was incredible demand from silver ETFs. That was something like 330 million ounces. There's something to remember about this. It's interesting how this relates to how inflation uh, works. Let's just look at that for a second. So, you know, people will say, okay, well, inflation has risen a lot. And if it slows, well, things are not so bad. But we have to remember that they are still bad because that has led to higher prices and higher sustained prices. Unless you get deflation, the inflation has caused higher prices that are now kind of baked in. And so what we've seen with the demand side for silver, uh, especially from ETFs, but certainly for physical silver as well, but from the ETFs specifically, is that as the holdings in ETFs build, it's very interesting to see that even if the silver price falls and can fall dramatically sometimes, the holdings in silver ETFs, they barely budge. And that's something that I've, I've coined silver is sticky money. And we've seen that, and that's going back at least a decade. In fact, it goes back to the inception of the first silver ETF, the SIL, which was the original silver ETF back in 2006, that the holdings have grown uh, dramatically and hardly ever drop. And so all it means is that as people buy into silver ETFs, they become uh, long-term holders. And so it, in a sense, it's like this silver is quasi permanently taken off the market. And so it drains the supply uh, in a very steady way. I believe that we've started a, a new commodities uh, super cycle. This was due to come. I think that the pandemic and the stimulus that came from the pandemic just sort of uh, accelerated and kicked it into high gear. Again, I, I do go into ways that people can manage risk. One is position sizing. I say that when you buy into a silver investment, to buy into it in tranches, uh, split that up into two or three purchases to, again, lessen your risk. But I think that the volatility is an advantage that uh, investors have, especially sort of smaller retail investors. You know, we're not bound like uh, money managers are. They have larger amounts that they have to move in and out of stocks. They have to maintain a certain amount of liquidity. They have to buy in stocks that are listed on specific exchanges. 
and uh, they have to react to uh, liquidations when uh, clients come back and say, you know, I, I want to liquidate some of my holdings in your fund. We can be a lot more patient as uh, individual investors. Wait for periods of weakness. Take advantage of that. Uh, look for mispricings. You know, again, we'll go back to that. There's volatility. Investors should take advantage of that volatility. They shouldn't let it scare them away from silver. They should make it work for them. And there's so much reward from investing in silver. As I said, you know, I talked about the gains that uh, silver produced in the 1970s. Uh, 3,700% in the metal itself is a 37 times return. If you can get that in the metal in a, a massive silver bowl, it's certainly not unrealistic to ex expect 10 to 50 and sometimes even in some special cases, 100 times or more returns in some silver stocks. We've seen that recently with uh, some gold stocks that you know have gone from discovery to massive uh, deposits that have been proven out. And that's very, very early in a bull market. So the potential really is huge and uh, it's, it's not something to be discounted. I really feel like given the opportunity and the economic outlook, people really need to have some exposure to silver, even if it's a smallish exposure. The, the upside is just so big for a small um, allocation to, to this space. Don't ignore the, the massive opportunity of silver itself, both from the physical and even from the much lower risk ETFs, uh, mining ETFs, and larger producers and royalty companies. The, it certainly takes uh, some conviction to hold these companies and to realize and to maybe assess where we are in the, uh, in the bull market, but it's very rewarding. There's no doubt about it. Uh, it's, it's definitely something uh, investors, and I, and I believe Every investor, even if we're talking about someone who's considerably older, um, really wants to take the, the least risk possible, I'll say go out and buy some silver coins, some from your uh, the mint of your your own country, or you know something that's easily traded or easily recognized and bought wherever you live. That's definitely something that you want to own. You know, silver is both a monetary metal and an industrial metal. In fact, it was part of money in the US and in Canada until uh, the 1960s when it was completely removed from our coinage. And so, you know, uh, the world's had a long history with silver as, as money, but in the last sort of uh, five, especially I'd say five to six decades or so, silver has really become an important industrial metal to the point where half of its consumption, half of its use every year, more than half goes to uh, industrial applications. And even 10% of all silver goes to um, solar power for solar panels. So, you know, with the, the green revolution, the green energy revolution, silver is becoming really more important than ever. In electronics, in medicine, in green energy, automotive, all of these certainly are pushing requirements of, of silver. And uh, that all contributes to it being irreplaceable, in my mind, no doubt about that.